الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته for everyone who has tuned in we give you and we start with السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله today we are blessed and privileged that we are joined with Sheikh Madiam Amir from the USA who inshallah will be covering the a important topic titled the power of dua and implementing dua in our daily lives of course in a session which is one hour which will consist of a presentation and a q a we will naturally be limited but inshallah um sheikha will try to cover as much and as much as possible and inshallah for those who have questions you can ask your questions on the chat um section on youtube inshallah which and we will try our best inshallah to cover as many questions towards the end for sure we cannot promise that we will answer each and every question but we will envisage inshallah to try to answer as many questions alhamdulillah sheikh madiam amir is based in the usa in california she alhamdulillah has a bachelor's and a master's and then further on she went to study a ba in sharia and islamic studies at the prestigious al-azhar university in egypt alhamdulillah she is also a hafidha of the Qur'an, someone who has memorized the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the beginning to the end, which we ask Allah to preserve her, inshallah, um, with this great ni'mah that Allah has blessed her. And alhamdulillah, she is also black belt in Taekwondo. So, so something, um, alhamdulillah, diverse skills and so forth. So really, without any further delay, I don't want to take any more time. I'll pass it on to Shaykh Madiam Amir, inshallah. Shukran lakum. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد كثير طيب مبارك فيه وصلاة وسلام على رسول الله. When I was so blessed to go for Hajj, Alhamdulillah, I was sitting in the rolda. Excuse me, I was sitting waiting to get into into the rolda. Any of you who have been blessed to go to Medina know that it's really difficult when you're a woman to go into the area where there's green carpet in the rolda. There were 4 million people who made Hajj that year. It was insanely crowded. And in addition to the fact that women have very specific timings when we are able to enter the Rolda, the area is very small. So we're sitting there as a group. I was so blessed to go with my mom and my aunt and my husband. And it was just my mom and my aunt with this group of women from our Hajj group, just waiting to see when we're gonna get into the Rolda. And as we're just waiting, I decided that I'm gonna make dua and drink Zamzam water because the Prophet ﷺ taught us that Zamzam is what you drink it for. So if you make a dua and you drink Zamzam with that dua, that is what that dua is inshallah going to be answered because of the way you drink Zamzam with it. So I sat, I drank some Zamzam water, I made dua and I asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open the way for myself and my mom and my aunt to please go into the Rolda and not just any part of the Rolda, but to be able to pray on the green carpet of the Rolda, which considering how many people were there and how many hours upon hours people were waiting to get in seemed like an impossibility. I made this dua. I walked back to where my mom and aunt were sitting with a group of women. And within moments, somebody came and said that it is our turn to go into the area to send our salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course you can send your salawat to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from anywhere in the world. Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammad. As we get up to start walking, a different woman comes up to me specifically. We are hundreds of women all over. I'm standing with other women closely. This woman singles me out and she comes up to me and she says, excuse me, are you part of this Hajj group? There is a woman who is outside on a wheelchair and her son is asking if somebody can take her into the Rolda. When she asked this, I have to be honest and ask for forgiveness from Allah because there was a moment where I was thinking, SubhanAllah, we just stood up and I was supposed to go into the Rolda right now. But now I'm not going to be going. I'm going to be going out so that I can inshallah support my sister. And it was... Alhamdulillah, just a moment that I felt that, but may Allah forgive me for that. And sometimes in those moments where we think that our dua is being answered and we're standing up to go into the rolda, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs us to a different place. I turned the opposite direction. 
I walked out of the doors of the masjid and I was so honored to meet this auntie, this beautiful, incredible auntie who is here to make Hajj with her son despite any of the difficulty. And so I had the immense honor of wheeling her into the area where we're supposed to go. And then as I get closer, there is a special section a specific section just for people who are coming in with wheelchairs. And so I'm taking this beloved auntie and we're going through this section. And instead of the area where there are hundreds and then outside thousands of women who are in this space together, who are all unfortunately fighting for space to just pray and make dua, there is so much chaos sometimes in the roda, And there's so many reasons for that. But in this place, with this place of wheelchairs, there are six people standing in a line, or excuse me, sitting in a line and standing and waiting for their turn to just peacefully be rolled into their special spot and to just sit or pray and make dua. I prayed two rak'ahs after two rak'ahs after two rak'ahs in the peace, in the, in the quiet of this special place of the roda with this beloved auntie. And I want to clarify that there are so many people in our ummah who are so honored and blessed. And we are so honored and blessed to have members of our ummah with different types of special needs, different types of disability. Some of them are hidden and some of them are visible. And in the time of the Prophet وسلم, some of the companions had disabilities, including Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum عنه, who was one of the muaddins of the Prophet and so we are so blessed and so honored that even in the leadership of the Prophet وسلم, he chose to teach all of us as an ummah that people with all types of different abilities are so needed in our ummah. And I had the honor of being somewhat in somewhat of a service to this sister. But in, a, in reality, this auntie honored me because it was through her that my dua of being able to pray in the roda was answered. And when I went out with this auntie, and alhamdulillah, I'm so grateful that we became very close friends during that trip. My mom and my aunt came out and I asked them, did you also get to pray in the roda? And they both had huge smiles on their faces. And alhamdulillah, yes, they had also been honored to pray in the green area where the carpet is green. And it's a sign that, inshallah, that's one of the places as if you're praying in paradise. But the reality of being able to pray in that special place wasn't really high because of the amount of people. Until that moment of making dua, I didn't know if it would happen. But with that dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only facilitated a way for us to enter and pray, but in a much better way than I would have even thought of doing, and in a way where I got to be blessed with the companionship of a new friend. When we make dua, sometimes we are hopeful, but other times we're making it from a place of pain. There are people who are going into dua because they so badly need it. And there are other people who are making dua casually. All of us sometimes, we are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a need so great that our hearts are breaking. And the hope that he could just open this door because of his power is there. But sometimes we lose sight of why we're making it in the first place. We lose hope after years of making dua. We wonder whether or not he's going to facilitate for us these doors of opening salah into the roda. And what we need to do is take that pain that we feel, and instead of allowing that pain to cripple and paralyze us in our hope, we need to take that pain and pull it all, pour it all, pour it all into the power of dua. Today, inshallah, we're gonna talk about what pain looks like when instead of allowing it to pull you down, you use it to lift you up in dua. The P for pain stands for power and protection. We're going to look at how we can make dua a place of protection, a place where we feel powered, empowered, a place where we feel it is a safe space. 
How do you look at dua as your safe space, as your refuge, as your place of protection? Listen to Maryam alayhi salam's mother as she makes dua. In the Quran, in a very famous dua, she is quoted to say, if she says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, talking about who is in her womb, that she, do, she, she gives this baby to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala muharrara. So accept it from me. The all hearing. The one who is always knowledgeable. The one who is well aware. Why is the mother of Maryam making this dua? It is because after so much excitement and hope and longing to have a baby. And the celebration for which she is pregnant. She's so excited about this pregnancy with her husband. Her husband passes away. Imran alayhi salam passes away. And so now she went from being an excited potential first new mother to the fear of having a child on her own and being a single mom. She is facing the rest of her life now raising a daughter on her own or a son. She didn't know it was a daughter at that time. She in fact thought it was a son. And she's making dua by two of Allah's names, As-Samir and Al-Alim. And these are the same two names that in Surah Yusuf, when Yusuf alayhi salam is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him, he's already been thrown in a well, he's been sold, the manipulation of his brothers, he hasn't, he's separated from his father, he's gone through so many things, and now the woman who was basically kind of like a, uh, kind of like she adopted him into her household as a child now she's trying to seduce him and also brings in all these other women to do so and so he is making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asking him saying that it's better to be thrown in prison than to be dealing with this and what does Allah say the same exact names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Maryam's mother alayhi salam called to him with. Allah is using those same names in the distress of Yusuf alayhi salam when he's calling out, when he's in this position as a slave in this household of a privileged person of power. He has no control and no idea where he can find refuge with, except with Allah. Allah answers him and says, As-Samir and Al-Alim. Why? Because a therapist told me that one of the most healing parts of your process in going through pain is being able to call out, make a dua, and know that you're going to be heard uninterrupted psychologically, it is validating for you to simply be able to speak without anyone stopping you and saying, that's not what happened, or stop you and saying, get over it, or stop you and saying, that's not a big deal, get up. in comparison to what everyone else is going through. Think about all the people who are going through those things. Think about all the people who are going through those. You're not over that yet. You're still not over that. Why are you still crying over that? All of those voices that you hear when you're trying to just express how much pain you're in, in dua, you can do that without obstruction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not only constantly listening, He is not only hearing everything that you're going through, He is also Al Alim. He knows it very personally. He knows very intimately why you're asking for what you're asking. He was witnessing what happened to you. He saw the trauma you experienced and he saw the joy that you hoped for. He knows all of it. And so in this safe place of dua, in this protection of dua, in this powerful moment when you call out in dua, he hears you. He already knows exactly what you're going through. And that is why it is so powerful 
when you call out to him, that you call out by these names, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he knows exactly what you're going through. Dr. Jinan Yusuf wrote an incredible book, which Al-Buruj Press, may Allah bless all of you, they published recently. It's called Reflecting on the Names of Allah. And in it, she talks about a very powerful point. She says that the very first ayah of the Quran that was revealed from Angel Jibreel alayhi salam to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam came at a time in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is constantly going into the cave of Hira and he is searching. He has lost babies in infancy. He himself was orphaned. He never knew his dad. He lost his mother at such a young age. The grandfather who took him in was already deceased. He was raised in poverty. He has gone through so much pain as an individual. And now he's looking for meaning and purpose, looking out over the Kaaba from this mountain. And in this isolation, in this cave, which was a safe physical space for him, an angel appears and says, what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the name Rabb. Why? A Rabb is often translated as your Lord. But who is Rabb? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the nourisher, the sustainer. He is the one who is the master, the one who... The rub is the one who ensures that you have a, 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 a ceiling over your, your head. He is the one who ensures that you have a shelter. He is the one who ensures that you are nurtured and nourished. A rub is comforting to the Prophet ﷺ because he has consistently lost people who were supposed to be caretakers for him. He has consistently had to depart with people who have comforted and nurtured him. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals himself through angel Gabriel to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the midst of this space of isolation with the name Rabb, the one who takes care of him, the one who is there as someone who is going to nurture and nourish him, the one who is his master and will guide him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And so when you are in these places, when you are in school or at work or in the middle of quarantine with your children and you are going crazy or you're wishing that you had children to go crazy with, whatever you are going through, he is your safe space. And his names are the ones that we call out to because he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, teaches us who he is through them. There is a woman who told me, she's an older woman whose husband passed away over almost 10 years ago. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have so much mercy on him and enter him into the highest paradise and all of her loved ones. And she said that she used to walk on a cliff that would overlook a beach and just walk there every single day looking out at an apartment building. And this apartment building had patios. And on these patios, there was one with a chair. And she would look at that specific patio and stare at that chair and she would wish that she could just sit on that chair and look out at the ocean drinking some tea. And one day her loneliness just became too much to bear. She sat in her home and she broke down to Allah and she asked Allah to bring someone who could be her friend, somebody who could help her not be so, so lonely, calling out to Ar-Rabb, calling out to the one who she knows is listening, As-Samir, to Al-Alim, who knows her circumstances. And then after she poured out her heart and she told me this wasn't a regular dua. This was her heart breaking and everything coming out in dua. A week later, she was walking back on those cliffs and she saw a woman who looked like she was looking just for her. She made a beeline just for this auntie. She just went straight to this auntie and she was like, who are you? This is my name. How are you? And they started to talk. They were both in similar life, life, life experiences, both in their 70s and 80s. 
talking to one another about their lives. And then this woman asked this auntie to come back to her home and continue their conversation over tea. Now, this auntie was like, you know, I just met this lady, but she felt comfortable with her. And so she went. Where did they walk to? That apartment building that the auntie was always seeing. And she invited this auntie into her home and asked her to go onto the patio while she made some tea. And so now she opens the patio door and she sees that very same chair she used to see while she was walking, wishing that she could sit on that chair. And now she's being invited to sit on that very same chair. And she's drinking the tea that this woman is inviting her to drink on her patio looking out over the ocean that she so longed to sit in that chair, drink that tea, look out at the ocean with. And now she's made a friend. And this friend with her goes everywhere. And subhanAllah, look how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't just answer her dua. Answering her dua would have simply been sending someone. She not only answered her dua with friendship, but he perfected that answer by giving her a want of her heart that she never asked for. She wanted, but she never made dua for. Simply sitting and looking out at that ocean in the chair. SubhanAllah, when you make dua your safe space, when you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who will answer you, you know that you can go there with all of your fears and all of your tears and that he will respond, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is making dua protection. That is the P in pain. Taking your pain, pouring it out into dua as a place of protection, as a place of safety, as a refuge. Let's go to the A in pain. That is assurance. Being assured that when you make dua, Allah will answer you. Why? Because it's not about the person who's making dua. It's not about you. It's about the one you are making dua to whether or not you are doing all the deeds that you used to do in the past. So many people tell me, I used to be so on top of my worship. I would make tahajjud, I would pray extra fast, but now with the reality of responsibilities of life, I can't do all of those things. In Ramadan specifically, I hear all the time from people who used to be able to spend hours in the masjid and now they're at home with responsibilities and they can't give the same type of worship sacrifice and they feel terrible about it. I myself have gone through this. I would just spend so much of Ramadan weeping because not weeping out of piety, weeping out of regret. Like I used to be this person of worship and now my reality is I can't do that anymore. And one of my teachers taught me, he said that Ibn al-Ta'illah says that you wanting to do something, you wishing that you could do other types of worship that you cannot do because of the responsibilities Allah has put into your life right now. That is your own desire. It's your own desire to do all of these extra things, which is wonderful. It's wonderful you have that desire. But that's not the type of worship that Allah is asking of you. He is asking of you to work full time so you can support your family. He is asking of you to, 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 to emotionally be there, to support someone you love. He is asking you to physically take care of someone in your life that you need to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is having these responsibilities in your life. But we look at ourselves and we think, I'm not reading Quran like I used to. Or we think about other people. And how, look at their righteousness and look at us in comparison. So what about people like us? What about people who, you make dua, but you think, I'm not good enough for my dua to be answered, but then what? Listen to what the Prophet wasallam says. He told us that dua is ibadah. And then he recited, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبَ لَكُمْ Your Lord says, commands. It is an actual command. Make dua to me, I will respond to you. It is a promise that if you make dua, Allah will respond. And he also says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ that when you, when you ask about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is close. Qareeb, ujib. 
أجيب دعوة الداعي إذا دعان أجيب he answers the one who calls when that person calls what are these look قريب he is close أجيب one of the names of Allah سبحانه وتعالى is المجيب he is the one who responds he answers you and he's pairing up this name and this attribute of his name Mujib, al Ujib, he is the one who answers. Al Mujib is the one who answers. He's pairing these up and saying that when you ask something, when you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no matter where you are, whether it's something in your heart or a whisper, or you're screaming out loud, begging him, whatever it is, he is close and he answers. And that is a promise. It is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, Allah, make dua to Allah, and you are certain, that you are certain, have this assurance that he will answer you. And again, it's not about who you are. It's about who you're asking. Because in dua, you are affirming all of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes. He is al-kareem. He is the constantly generous. You affirm to him that you know his generosity, which is why you are asking. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught the companions to make dua, even, it's for, even if it's for their shoelaces, make dua for everything, for the big and for the small. You might lose your car keys and you're like, oh, am I really gonna like pour, like pour my heart out and dua for my car keys? But at the same time, we need, you need your car keys to get out and you can't find them anywhere. So yes, make dua, pour your heart out and dua for your car keys and add a phrase, add a phrase. And oh Allah, anything else I should have made dua for right now. Oh Allah, everything good, everything good in this life and the next, give it to me and my loved ones. You pour out your dua for the small, include the big two. You never ever lose with the dua. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that every single dua will be answered as long as you're not asking for something sinful and you're not asking to cut off ties with relatives. And I wanna make a clarification here. There are lots of relatives who are very toxic. They are abusive. They are physically abusive to people. I get these questions all the time. Those are different circumstances. You have to protect yourself and your family. But we're not talking about these, these types of circumstances. But when you are in circumstances where you are asking and you are just asking for something that's not sinful and not harmful to someone else, you're asking for you. The Prophet وسلم, told the companions about the promise of Allah to answer. What did the companions reply? They said, so we're going to ask for it. We're going to ask. We're just going to make dua. We're going to make dua. And the Prophet وسلم, said, the Prophet وسلم, taught them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is even greater than this. That it doesn't even, whatever you ask, he's going to answer and more. So keep asking. Continue to ask. Because whatever you ask, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises to answer. And I'm going to share a story with you, which I have shared widely before, and you've probably never heard of me, so it doesn't matter anyway. But if you've read the story before, I'm going to tell you the story of when I asked for something, which seems really minor, but it was a cell phone. And I was in Medina, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring my cell phone back from a taxi, because I left it in a taxi. And I was making this sincere, serious dua, thinking to Allah and saying out loud, Oh Allah, you've promised that if you make dua, that if I make dua, you will answer. You've told me that you are listening. The Prophet ﷺ told us to have yaqeen in our dua, and here I am making this dua to you. This cell phone to me was a brand new gift from someone that I loved. It had all of these notes that I hadn't backed up that were really important. And they had so many pictures of my child with his great grandparents. I didn't want to lose that because of all that it meant. And so I left Medina. And we went to Dubai and subhanAllah in transit, we were spending a few days there and my husband texted an old number and he texted it with a brand new number from Dubai. And if that number from Dubai had gone onto my cell phone, my old cell phone that I had left in Medina, it would have shown up with a whole bunch of string of numbers. But if he had texted with his own name on his regular cell phone, it would have shown up just as his name. SubhanAllah, I get, a, I get a phone call on that number that night. And it was a woman in Medina who told me, I found a cell phone in Medina. And this is the number that showed up. She wasn't, she had, SubhanAllah, she had to be able to read that number, charge my phone, take it off airplane mode. She had to know how to do all of these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought a very truthful person 
who knew how to work with this type of phone, who was willing to make that call. And then subhanAllah, the fact that she was able to see that number instead of just my husband's name. So she was able to make a call with it because it's locked, so she couldn't open it. So then, may Allah bless Sheikh Hasib Noor and Sheikh Ahmed Billu. They're, with their help, Sheikh Hasib was able to get my cell phone from the woman in Medina, meet one of my friends who went to make Umrah in Mecca from California, gave her that phone. And she came back, she lived seven hours away from me, but I was speaking at a conference in her city the day after she arrived from Mecca. And subhanAllah, her sister gave me that cell phone that I left in a taxi in Medina. This is so minor, a cell phone. Who cares about losing your cell phone? Obviously cell phones are important to us today. But at the end of the day, are you gonna pour your life out into dua? Yes, you are. Why? Because it's not just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring the heavens and the earth together to answer a dua so minor like a cell phone. But what about you who is going through depression? What about you who has just lost someone you love? What about you who is struggling in your marriage? Whatever you are going through, if he can answer my dua by bringing everything together for it, then what about the reality of what you are going through, which is so much greater than a cell phone? And what are you doing? You are hoping in him. You are trusting in him. You are showing your love to him while you doubt yourself while you wonder whether or not you're good enough, while you question the sins that you commit, but you're still trying to pray even if sometimes you struggle with it. You're still trying. Don't you think that he sees that? Don't you think that he loves that? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appreciates. He is a shakur. He appreciates even the smallest amount of good that you do. And he doesn't just appreciate by saying, thank you. He appreciates it by rewarding it, not just for your small action, but it can be 10 to 700 to even an infinite amount greater amount of times of reward for what you've done in this life and especially in the hereafter. Because he is a shakur. He is so grateful for everything. He is the appreciative. And that's why we should never put our hope in our dua being answered because of us. He answers our dua because of who he is, not because of who we are. And in your hoping of him, when you make dua with certainty and you say, oh Allah, I am not deserving of this blessing, but I ask you anyway, because you are the one who has the full power and capacity and the generosity to give it to me. You are doing worship. You are doing one of the highest forms of worship. And he is so grateful for that. It is beloved to him. And he promises to answer you. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we're talking about turning our pain into dua, and we look at it as a place of protection, and we look at it as a place in which we are assured that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer us, we then go into the next part. And that is I. That is insight. When we make dua, there are so many times that we don't feel like our dua is answered. So often when we make dua, we feel like he's not answering us this prayer. And I get this question very often from people who say things like they've been making a specific dua for 10 years, or they've been making a specific dua for a certain amount of time, and they're emotionally overwhelmed. They don't know if they should still make this dua because it's too hard for them emotionally to keep making it. Should I still make dua for this? Is it a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just doesn't want this to happen in my life? Should I give up on this? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that, again, as long as we're not making dua for something sinful or breaking ties, then what? Then he promises to reply. And these are two different narrations. And one of them, it's as long as we don't say, I made dua, I made dua, I made dua, and Allah is not responding. And in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ teaches us there are different ways for dua to be answered. Your dua can be answered by give, being given exactly what you asked for, and maybe in an even better way. Your dua can be answered by some type of evil being removed from your life, being protected from something 
The Prophet ﷺ told the companions that dua is for what has already happened, what is already happening in your life and what's going to happen. So always make dua subhanahu wa, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in these, in these, um, in these uh, different ways, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can answer you. So whether it's going to be through that dua specifically being answered or whether it's going to be some type of evil averted or whether it's going to be on the day of judgment you coming on the day of judgment and you see the blessings of your dua there, that's when it's given to you. And you say, I wish that I had been, received nothing except for, 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 in, for in the hereafter. Or it could be given in a different way at a different time. And so there is no way that your dua is not answered. Ibn Hajab, he mentions, he's a great scholar. I'm our pastor with a commentary of Sahih al-Bukhari. He mentions that your dua, every single dua is answered. You can make the claim that all of my du'as are answered when I ask sincerely, as long as you also recognize, like Ibn Hajr mentions, it might be in a different way than what you expect. What about when you're so emotional over something specific that you are asking for, then what? In that case, you don't say, I made du'a and I made du'a and Allah didn't answer me. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I am as my servant thinks I am. He is as you think he is. So if you are making dua and that whole time you are thinking, Allah's not going to answer me. Why would he answer me? He's just going to test me. He knows how badly I want this. And because he knows how badly I want it, he's not going to give it to me. And he's going to test me instead with the exact opposite of what I'm asking for. May Allah forgive us for thinking this way. How can we make dua? How can we make dua asking? And that whole time we're saying, he's not even, not only not going to reply, he's going to test me because he knows how badly I want this by giving me the exact opposite. He says, I am as my servant thinks I am. You make dua to him with insight, knowing that he is listening, he will answer you, but also trusting that he might give you something different because that is what is better for you. Or he might give you exactly what you're asking for. Or sometimes people who get exactly what they're asking for regret what they got and they wished that they had not asked for that thing. So make sure when you're asking, you say, if it's best for me or give me something better, which is why in the dua of istikhara, it's so beautiful because in the dua itself, when you're making this prayer, asking Allah for guidance on what to decide, that you leave it up to him to guide you to what is best. And you trust that if it's not best, when you make istikhara, do you know what happens? Allah removes what you made what you made the decision for. You might make a certain decision, but then it wasn't the right decision. Allah will remove it and instead bring you back to the right decision. You can never go wrong with dua. You can never go wrong with istikhara. But if it becomes too emotional and too difficult for you to make that dua, because every single time you make it, you're pouring all of your emotions into it. You're weeping, you're getting headaches because you can't handle the amount of emotion you're pouring into this dua. Then it's okay to take a break from the intensity of your emotion and instead say, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that when you make the dua, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al nar, oh Allah, give us um, uh, goodness in this life and goodness in the next life and save us from um, the hellfire. When you make that dua, you intend that that also includes that thing that you passionately want, that you would be making dua for, but you just emotionally can't handle right now. You just need a short break. You need a break until you're ready to go back to that dua. That's okay, but keep making dua. You can still make that dua in a different way, in a way that you can handle it, but never give up. And I wanna tell you that what you're asking for realistically, maybe it will come true, but maybe it won't. And accepting, who he is and that he knows what is best for you is part of the process of taking your pain and turning it into something that dua will not leave you feeling so hurt from, but instead helping you feel uplifted through. When I was in college, there was a dua I was making all the time, everywhere. SubhanAllah, I remember making it in Ramadan in the elevator on my way up to the different floors in the library, in sujood, while I was fasting all the time. And the more I made this dua, the more one door would close, after another would close, after another would close. The doors would constantly close for me. 
And subhanAllah, I kept making this dua one year, after the next year, after the next year. And I felt like no matter how much I prayed, I was being steered onto all these different paths away from it. From the time I made that dua, do you know when that dua was answered? That dua that I made in college, when I was, subhanAllah, constantly praying, wasn't answered for another 10 years. 10 years of making that same dua. And in the moment when my dua was answered, I realized that all those doors that closed over and over again, they had to close to put me onto a path which would guide me to that dua being answered. And when it was answered, it wasn't answered in the way I envisioned it in college. I couldn't have envisioned it even being answered in the beautiful, perfect way, in the perfect timing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for it to be answered. Sometimes our du'as are going to take a long time. But do you know what you lose in that process? Nothing. Do you know what you gain in that process? Every time you make du'a, something better is coming, some evil you're protected from, some other blessing is coming. You're getting something in the hereafter, your sins are being forgiven, but most importantly, you are building a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are building a sweetness in that relationship that is only born out of desperation. That type of sweetness comes when you have nowhere to go except for Allah. La malja'a illallah. There's, excuse me, there's no um, illa ilay. There's no uh, refuge from Allah except with Allah. Subhanallah, that process brings you closer to him. So how can you lose with the power of dua? So that is looking at the insight of dua, knowing that when you're making dua, you're looking at it in an insightful way, looking at it with this perspective, that no matter what you are praying for, he will answer, just maybe not in the exact way you expect it. But you trust him because he is al-hakim, he is the most wise, and he knows what is best for you. And with that, Let's look at N for narrative. Sometimes in the dua that you make, you are giving, you're making this dua, you're, you're, you're saying these words with a narrative that you don't fully understand. So for example, let's look at the mother of Musa alayhi salam. The mother of Musa is given this baby boy, not a girl. She's born, she bears a baby boy. Now, when she has this baby, there is a hunt for baby boys. They are being slaughtered by the Pharaoh. She could have said, oh Allah, why didn't you give me a girl instead? Then I could keep my baby and not have to go through any type of worry. You know what she did? She listened to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided her to do, which is to put her infant into a basket in a river. And where did it go? This baby was not taken to another country. It was taken to the palace of the murderer of all baby boys. How many times have we made dua and when we see that, we think, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you feel like your trust is broken. I hear from people all the time who say that they're resentful of God. They feel like they can't trust him. That they feel like they don't believe that he is on their side. And that comes from a place of pain, very real pain. There are so many people who go through trauma, abuse, so many things that they feel like God could have prevented. But when we look at the reality, many times those are because someone else has done something to that person and their trust in God is broken because of the way someone taught them about God. A parent who physically beat their child, may Allah protect all of our children and help us be much better, help us be great parents, that's insane. And so in telling them, read the Quran, read the Quran, read the Quran, and they're slapping them, which is haram, this is not permissible to do in any sort of way, this child becomes terrified of the Quran and they're shaking when they try to read the Quran when they're in their 40s because of something that happened when they were 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That is not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala harming this person. That is that parent or that Quran teacher, or that individual who caused harm to that child. But because they've taught Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be this terrifying, you know, 
God who is out to get you, their minds can't move past that feeling. Go to therapy. It's so important to go to therapy, seek the help of a Muslim health professional who can help you process these emotions and recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you, that he cares for you. And that like the mother of Musa alayhi salam, alayhi salam, alayhi salam, when she sees her, her boy is delivered to a palace and his sister comes and says that she can help this baby be taken to someone who can nurse him. So what happens? Musa alayhi salam is returned to his mother, but now it's not a secret. Now it's in the safety and the protection of the Pharaoh. So she can be with her child in safety and protection. And the state is actually providing her provision, paying her for this job so that she can have her baby and not be afraid. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to give her baby back. And that baby had a bigger role. He had to free the people of Egypt, the, the, the Banu Israel, he had to free them from the oppression of Pharaoh. He had to call Pharaoh to worshiping Allah and to social justice. And how did he do those things? By being raised by the Pharaoh in the palace, in a place of power, so he could come back and deliver this message, which not only helped his personal life, but created a legacy, helped an entire nation. And until today, we make dua for Musa alayhi salam. And we, we say about his mother, Musa alayhi salam. Why? Because in your life, sometimes we only see the narrow view of what we see in the moment. But Allah knows our future. You don't know what, they, what, what type of legacy you're going to leave. You know when it matters what you did on this life in 500 years. What you did in this world is going to matter in 100 years. It's going to matter when you're not on this world anymore. That is when it's going to matter. And Allah knows that about the reality of our lives. Because when you are, when we are gone, when we are in our graves, before we're even resurrected, the deeds that we have planted, maybe from the tears that you cried because of something that you didn't understand, maybe those tears nurtured the soil through which, in which were seeds, that, that flowers were bloomed. And those, those flowers became fruit and birds, birds are eating from that fruit. And you never even planted that seed. You just cried the tears that nurtured that, 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 that bloom that came out that helped all of these animals eat from it, that became sadaqa jariya for you when you aren't even here anymore. That's when you need your dua to be really answered. And of course we want it to be answered now. But subhanAllah, Allah sees that there is an entire, entire forever, an entire eternity. And so out of his wisdom, he answers what's best for us out of his love for us, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is your narrative of dua. Coming to Allah with that narrative. Coming to Allah in, with the etiquette of dua. How do you call upon him? Allahumma. Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned that Ab Allahumma means that you are taking all of the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his attributes and you are calling upon him by these names and attributes. So you're saying, oh Allah, it's not just oh Allah, it's Allahumma. I ask you by all of these incredible, beautiful, powerful names and attributes, and then you ask. But you praise him first, and then you say, Allahumma salli wa sallam ala nabiyina wa habibina Muhammad. You send salawah on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that can be, oh Allah, please, Send your praise and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in whatever um, way that you you send your peace and blessings to him sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why do we do that? You know what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has gone through, and as you're going to make du'a, whether it's something painful or something joyful or whatever it is, you remember you're not the only one who's alone. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam went through so much pain in his lifetime. You aren't alone. You are heard. You're sending salawat on the one, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who sacrificed so much for you, for our ummah, and who keeps special du'as just for you. His du'a for you is continuing to be answered right now in our lifetimes and in the hereafter, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And then you ask. It's from the etiquette to be in wudu, to face the qibla, um, make du'a for people when you are not seeing them behind, you know, you can, what, even if you're seeing them privately, because an angel will say ameen. And when angels say ameen, the angels, when they say ameen, their dua is accepted. 
So the righteous people, when they needed something, they would make dua for their brothers and sisters because they knew that the angels would say, Amin, and for you too. So make dua for other people and remember that you are going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is your safe space. So Sheikh Rida, he was the, mas- the imam of the masjid that I used to pray in. Um, I don't know if Shazia is here, but Shazia, if you remember, when we used to make dua behind Sheikh Rida, in the beautiful Masjid Bilal in Egypt when we were studying there, this Imam would make dua, not like how most of us make dua. Even all of the years that I've been so blessed to pray in different masajid for tarawih, I've never heard a dua made like this. This is the way he, he used to make that dua of witr. He would praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he would send salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he would break down. He would say, oh Allah, we are our fuqara, we are so needy, we are so poor. Oh Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, la taruddana khaibin, la taruddana khaibin. Don't turn us away, don't turn us away. If you turn us away, who will answer us? You told us, and your word is the truth. Ud'auni astajib lakum. So here we are making dua to you. Answer us, answer us, answer us. He would beg, he would plead. And the du'as that he made that I've never made for myself in my life, but I was there to say, Amin, his du'a became true in my life because the power of his asking as someone who's, who's in need and who's in love and who knows, oh Allah, if you turn us away, who will answer us? Subhanahu wa ta'ala, affirm that he will answer you. And there are two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, excuse me, two ahadith in which um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you ask that th- this person has asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by names in which that if Allah uh, is asked by these names, then he will answer. SubhanAllah, there are two beautiful du'as. I'm suddenly seeing that we have very little time for Q&A. So I'm going to ask inshallah Al-Buruj to send out these du'as to you in an email. And inshallah, you can learn them on your own and make du'a to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala by these names that he promises will be answered. The Prophet ﷺ didn't specify which name is in uh, is the one that he will answer with, but it's one of those names, and you can you can make du'a with all of them. And I really recommend, as I mentioned, this book, reflecting on the names of Allah. So much of the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that I talked about today was from this beautiful book in English. It's the best. Where did I go? Is the best that I've ever read in English. It's called "Reflecting on the Names of Allah" by Jinan Yusuf. You can get it from El Buruj um, and on Amazon. And Subhanallah, take the names of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, learn them. Make dua to them and you will find your relationship with him a completely different one. Take your pain, protection, assurance, insight, and narrative. Take those four letters that cause you so much pain into dua. Feel empowered by them, uplifted by them, and feel your life change. When you have pain, take it to dua. Subhanallah, the Prophet said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is shy and generous. When you take your hands up to him, he is shy to let those hands leave empty. He is so generous that he will always answer. Never doubt that your dua will be answered. Pray, call to him, and he will answer. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik nashawa na ilaha illa anna staghfir kawana tubu ilayk. Inshallah, we have a few minutes for Q&A now. Jazakumallahu um, khaydan, Shaykh Ahmadiyam, for your very beautiful speech. Alhamdulillah. Um, we are going to take a few questions now, inshallah. Um, alhamdulillah, just to let you know, alhamdulillah, we've got um, many sisters who have tuned in from South Africa, Cape Masha Town, Allah. from France, from Malaysia, from Singapore, Masha from Australia. Allah. May Allah bless you all. And so, so um, and it, of course, from London, from the UK and so forth. But one of the real benefits of these live sessions is, alhamdulillah, that is, that is able to connect a global community, alhamdulillah. So... Um, the first question which we have, and if you feel you've covered it, please let me know so then we can inshallah just move on. Um, the first question is, how long do you wait for your dua to be accepted and what if it doesn't get accepted? So the, the, the brief point is that as long as you're asking sincerely, your heart is present. Umar anhu said that he wasn't afraid of his dua not being accepted. He was afraid that his heart wouldn't be focused and present in that dua. If you're doing those things and you're sincerely making that dua and it's not for something sinful, for example, your dua is accepted 100%. It's how is the dua going to be accepted? That's the question. 
What will it look like in your life? We don't know. So you keep making that dua. It could be tomorrow. It could be today. It could be 10 years from now. It could be never in the way that you're asking. But that doesn't mean he's not bringing you other blessings and other gifts and other benefits and other protection simply because you're making dua. So keep asking no matter what. Jazakumullahu khairan. Next question is, sometimes we, sometimes we make dua and we get something different to what we have asked for. How can we work on a tawakkul to accept what is given as an answer and not feel disappointed, i.e. to be content? The best way to do this process is by learning who Allah is. And the two ways that I recommend you do that is number one, reading the Quran every single day in a language that you understand. Whether it's just one ayah or one page or two pages, make the intention every single day, no matter what you're going to read and in a language that you understand. Knowing who he is allows you to trust the decisions he makes for your life when you feel like you don't have control. Sometimes we have control in our decisions. Other things we don't. Sometimes he's closing a door for you, as Ibn al-Qayyim mentioned. Sometimes a door is closed for you, so an even better one opens. Sometimes one door is closed, so two doors open in his mercy. One door closes in his wisdom, two doors open in his mercy. So sometimes you don't know what's best for you. You have no idea. And that other thing might be the best thing. But it's hard to accept that because that's not what we want. But when you know who is making that decision and it's out of love for you, then when you look back on that moment 15 years later, then you can see, subhanAllah, I didn't, I couldn't see it at that time. That was what was best for me. So knowing who he is through the Quran, and as I showed the book, going to this reflecting on the names of Allah book, picking one name a week, reading that book, that, that name that week, making dua to Allah by that name, and see how your relationship with him changes over that period of time, inshallah. Okay, jazakumullahu khairan. Um, next question is, um, when is the best time to make dua? Oh, thank you. Yeah, SubhanAllah. Is yes. This is, I was going to cover that in the etiquettes and then I saw the time and I rushed through it. Thank you for bringing this up. So there are like a million different times to make dua um, and they're accepted. The very best time, I can't say there's a very specific best time because there's so many. When you're fasting, when you're traveling, when you're sick, when you're in sujood, in the time after you make the tashahud before you give the salam, um, when you're here between the adhan and the iqama, when it's raining, there are so many times to make dua. So really don't limit yourself. Just make it your habit that you make dua all the time, any time that you need something and you don't. You just go and you make dua. And of course, there are certain times like these that I mentioned and so many more in which that dua is extra special, inshallah. Okay, jazakumullahu khairan. Um, for, those who are, for those who are asking about the book, the book is called um, Remembering the Names of Allah by Dr. Jinan Yusuf, alhamdulillah. You can, um, you can send us an email to purchase a copy or simply you can go to Amazon to purchase a copy for worldwide delivery from wherever you are from. The last question, inshallah, Shaykha, is at times I get scared to ask Allah for something because I fear that I will have to pay a price. And um, sorry, and as a weak human, um, I will not be able to cope. Um, what do you advise? sister or brother who asked this question, I want you to know that you are asking this question from a place of something that happened in your life. Someone has taught you that there's a price to ask. Um, that is not how dua works. Allah never ever asks us for something in exchange for our dua. Of course, we are asked to try our best to worship him, to try our best to ask for forgiveness when we make mistakes. Obviously, we are asked to do certain things in terms of our guidelines and the ways that we live. But that is different from having an exchange of this dua is going to come true and therefore I have to pay for it in a different way. Allah is al kareem He is the generous. He, he, he needs nothing from you in exchange. You don't have to pay for, as a result for something that he's given you. So obviously, we have to do certain actions. We have to do the work to get to where we need to be. But if you are looking towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you're thinking in this way about his answer, then I highly recommend you see where that thought is coming from. Because that's not a thought that comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance. It's a thought that maybe came from something you've experienced in the past or something that's, um, that's something that's conditioned you to believe that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is generous. He is al-jawad. He is generous without measure. He's generous. He is al-mannan. He is generous without cutting it off with no, with nothing except giving. So like I mentioned the previous steps, Quran, reading this book, go to therapy, 
those are things inshallah which will help us change our perception of him and in doing so be able to help us trust his generosity without expecting something back Jazakumullahu khairan we are going to finish the session here inshallah so uh, so we've kept it exactly to an hour um jazakumullahu khairan may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you shaykh maryam may allah preserve you your family your kids your husband your parents inshallah and we ask allah that he unites us in a better place inshallah um, in Masjid Al-Aqsa first and then yeah. the maybe hopefully inshallah oh, amen, amen. Alhamdulillah, we were blessed um, in the Ramadan 2019 where Sheikha Maryam was one of the teachers for the um, for the students who went and she was really one of the first western female speakers to be able to deliver sessions um, in the haram itself um, in the noble sanctuary so we ask Allah to elevate you and to bring you again um, to this position again inshallah and Sheikh Zaid Barakalo Fiq may Allah bless Al Buruj Press for all the work that they're doing this isn't physically possible women being in spaces like this is not possible without the work of someone like Al Buruj may Allah bless you and bless all of the efforts that you put Allah. forth Allah. and we hope to see you soon inshallah and for those for everyone who has tuned in for those who came late um, you are going to be sent an email tomorrow, inshallah, so you can watch the video again, inshallah, and take notes. Assalamu alaikum wa